Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. Bring in the energy. Look, you, you front row right here. I like it. I like it. You're in the splash zone. You know that, right? All right. <laughs> hey, uh, let's give a shout out for all of our people in our overflow. Uh, they're watching. I, I just want to encourage you because some of you are new. Um, we are building an auditorium on the end, and uh, it is going to be great. We're going to make room for more, all right? So uh, I love that you guys keep inviting your friends and family. Hey, and we will make room for them, even if we have to put them up on the roof. Uh, we, will, we will do it, all right? So, um, yeah, I love this video. Thank you, Jared, so much for making that. That is great. We're starting a brand new series here at Atmosphere. So if this is your first time with us. What a great Sunday to choose to come and, and be a part of our gathering. And uh, we're going to get into this book called 1 Corinthians. Uh, some people call it 1 Corinthians, all right? Whatever you call it, it's going to be a good book study. I even heard somebody call it the book of First Californians. Uh, <laughs> Because it's a lot like our story, uh, living in California. It's messy. It's a it's a messy church. And uh, if if you are trying to find a church that's not messy, good luck to you. All right. Uh, you've just walked into a messy church. You know, we can't even find room for everybody. But uh, it's going to be a great study. And by the way, this is the twenty second day of our twenty one days of prayer. Do the math there. So. What God did in these last 21 days was next level. And so I don't want it to stop, and we don't have to make it stop. So you just keep praying, and, I mean, breakthrough happened. Those cards that you guys filled out, wow. It was so neat because some people kept drawing the same cards. And so you, those of you that filled these cards out, you have an intercessor for the problems and trouble that you wrote down on those prayer cards. Because people are like, Pastor Jim, I got this card four times in a row. Like, and they're just out there, you know, like pick a card, any card. That, that's kind of the, the, the kind of method that we used. And people kept drawing the same card. So I, I just think that is so, so fun. Uh, so anyway, if you uh, want to follow along, we have all of our notes on our app. Uh, so you can open up your app. But if you want to open up Scripture, even though we're studying the book of 1 Corinthians, we're actually going to go to the book of Acts because we want to go to where it all started. How many remember back in 2020 with those memes that were circulating Twitter and Instagram and, and TikTok, how it started, how it's going? How many remember seeing some of these things? Uh, so... Before we get into 1 Corinthians and how it's going, I want to just watch how it started. So kind of like this. I, I saw a couple of these. Um, Selena Gomez. Uh, how many knew she started on Barney? How many even remember Barney? You remember Barney? It's like uh, our kids grew up watching Barney. But Selena Gomez got her start there. Now she is like an amazing superstar recording artist. It's just phenomenal. Uh, I like this one. 
Mark, you'll appreciate this one. Here's this guy. I don't know even know who this is, but I just thought it was fun. You know, he's riding as a kid in a in an airplane. Now he's flying one. I just think it's so cool how it started, how it's going. I, I especially like this next one. Uh, that's me. That's me. 1991, baby. Yeah, with my bride. We've been married 30 years now. It's just like it's crazy. But that's our little baby faces right there. And then we just took that. How many ever went to that Holiday Road? I think it's in Calabasas that we took that picture. That's our family now. It's like Ben and Belle are part of our family. Ben on the far right. He kind of looks like Josiah. It's kind of weird. Um, but but like, that's what Tara and I got for Christmas. We got a son-in-law. So my daughter's married now. It's amazing. And I like this next one, how it started, how it's going. Yeah, I, you guys, this is amazing. Like, I just like, I'm having a moment right now because we started at the Best Western Hotel with about 40 of us for a Thursday night Bible study. That's when we first started. And that was just like four and a half years ago. And, and just look what God has done. And I'm so grateful for this auditorium because we might be in the amphitheater being rained on and being super cold. So it's just like, wow. But some of you, let's be honest, you can relate to this next one. How it started, how it's going. How many relate to this? You're like, that. now that's me. Yes. That's a real dog. That's not Photoshopped. It's, yeah, but somebody loves that dog, so don't be so sad. Like, like so that's somebody's pet, you know? Uh, but I just think, like, when, when you think about your life, some of you are like, that's my story. That, that's it. Like, I, it started like, oh, but now it's not going. That, this is the story of 1 Corinthians. It started off as a revival. Now, let me give you some backstory before we jump into Acts 18. Corinth is modern day Greece, okay? So, Corinth back in ancient times was about 50 miles west of what we now call Athens. It was called Athens even back then. It was a Roman Empire epicenter. Like they, they did all their trades there. Like all the big business was done in Corinth. And it was a very dark, dark city. There was a temple on the top of the city that was dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite. Now, Aphrodite, within Greek mythology, some of you that, that know a little bit about Greek mythology, she was the goddess of sex, of beauty, of, of fertility. And so they had this weird thing that they would do is they would have these prostitutes that when people would want to, you know, get blessed by Aphrodite, they, they would be with these prostitutes as a form of worship. And it sounds so weird to us, but, but they did this. And this is kind of like how they lived life. Like the, the problems and the trouble and the darkness in Corinth was so bad that historians say that when you would try to describe somebody that was an alcoholic that was drunk all the time, you would say, oh, there goes another Corinthian. Like it was, it had that reputation. This was the original Sin City. This was like ancient Las Vegas. Matter of fact, they had a saying back then, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. I'm, I'm just teasing. They really didn't say that. But you, you think like, wow, it's just this wicked, this next level wickedness. And Paul says, I, I think that'd be a good place to start a church. Now, some people are like, what, like Corinth? You're going to go to Corinth and like, like tell them about Jesus? And he's like, yeah, yeah. Like, I can't think of a better group of people that need to know about the light than those people that are in full darkness. And I, I get this because some of you don't know our story, but my father-in-law and I, we planted a church in Las Vegas. Did you know that? In 2002, we planted a church in Las Vegas that's still going. Uh, God has new leadership over there, and I'm still connected with them over there. Matter of fact, in, in November, we went back there and celebrated our 20-year church anniversary, and it was epic. It was so amazing. And, and, you know, when we started the church there, my wife was like, I don't know about this. And, and then we, we planted the church, and then we moved over there. And I remember just, like, being in the city, and we went to the hockey game one night, and, and Tara 
you know, and by the way, we were seeing God do phenomenal things. Like it was crazy the amazing things that God was doing. So I just want to tell some of you that just have written Las Vegas is Sin City. I'm telling you, God is alive and moving in Las Vegas. He is moving in Sin City. He's even moving on the strip there. It's just amazing things are happening. Lives are being changed over there. It's crazy. But I remember just like having this moment where I, I'm just encouraging my wife because she was like super like nervous raising kids in Las Vegas. She goes, how are, how are we supposed to like raise our son in the city? And I'm trying to like build this up and encourage her. I go, hey, Tara, there is a Vegas in every city. It's called the internet. Like it, everybody can have access to what people in Las Vegas are, are, are having access to. So I'm having this conversation in the car, all right? So we're at an intersection. Like, so I'm stopped at a red light. And so I'm selling her. She's like, yeah, I get it. And then it, this is comedy. Okay, a van pulls up next to us. It's got wrap around it of naked women, all right? There's a pull in the van with lights going on. There is a party happening in the naked van, all right? And so she sees it. She looks over at me, and she says, so that is in every city? I go, touche, touche. So... So, it, like, Corinth is, is kind of got that reputation. But what we discovered and what Paul is going to really experience in Acts 18 is that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That, let me give you the scripture, Romans 5.20. It says, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Let me tell you. God's grace always trumps sin. It always trumps sin. And so if sin is next level, grace is going to be next level. So I believe, like we saw so many miracles and things happen in Vegas because the sin is so prevalent in Vegas. And so God is always outnumbering the, the things that sin is bringing. He's moving in the midst of that despite all of the stuff that is happening in Vegas. So let's come back to Corinth, all right? So the very beginning, all right, this is how it kind of all goes down. So Paul is on this missionary journey. He's spreading the gospel. He, ha he has this, this drive that the Spirit of God has given him to take this message globally. He's like, we shouldn't just keep this in Jerusalem. We need to take it and, and spread it across the world. And so he lands in Acts chapter 18. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And then when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, they were Paul's friends, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So they came with this offering, and Paul's like, great, like I, I can kind of rest tent making and I can do this full time, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went right next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Isn't that funny? So he's like leaving the synagogue going, man, they're not even receiving the message. Titus over there going, well, I kind of like that message. You want to just do that at my house? <laughs> so he just moved next door. I love this, right? And Crispus, the story gets even more interesting. Crispus, the synagogue leader. So he's like the manager of the synagogue. He, uh, he and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So in this dark city full of sin, God starts changing lives. I mean, there, this is revival status. And one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, said this, do not be afraid. 
Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Now, I just have to read this, this last part of the section because this is good. While Gallio was proconsul at Achaia, which was ancient Greece, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. So this is exactly like, remember the angel said, hey, no, no harm's going to come to you. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them out. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes. So Sosthenes becomes the successor to Crispus and runs the synagogue. And so now the people are mad at him going, man, you guys, you didn't help us. And they beat him in front of the proconsul and Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. And Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left his brothers and sisters and sailed to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Now, you know, when I do a Bible study, and I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I, I like to journal my notes when I'm, like, reading Scripture. And I have a method called SOAP. Remember when I talked about this? So the S is the Scripture. So when I'm journaling, I like to put on the top in the Scripture. The O is the observations. The A is the application. And the P is the prayer. It's a great way to, like, journal your Bible studies. But I, I want to give you Jim's O's here. I want to give you some observations that I made, and I just want to feature them, and I want to point them out to you because I believe they're applicable for us in our life and what we're going through. Uh, and, and so just listen to these. Number one, the, the first thing I kind of observed is that Paul had a support team that God had dispatched for him. So Aquila and Priscilla were on scene. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us whether they were followers of Jesus or not. Uh, it's debatable. Some say they were already followers. Other people say that Paul led them to Christ. But either way, they ended up becoming battle buddies for Paul. When God gives you a, an assignment, I want you to know there's always going to be a support team that he is going to dispatch to help you complete your assignment. I want you to know that. Like, this is part of the reason we are so big on life groups here is because you need a support team. And our belief is that God has anointed and called each and every one of you in a ministry. And in order for you to go ahead and do that ministry, you need the support of some friends to come alongside of you to see to it that you activate and do the ministry that God has called you to do. Because it's so much easier to do ministry when you're doing it with other people. Hello, somebody. It's so much easier when you do it with people. This, I'm believing, like, that's why Jesus dispatched his disciples in twos. Like, it's so much easier to be bold and courageous when you're doing it with other people by your side. So I believe firmly that God has a Priscilla and Aquila waiting for your life. You say, how do I find them? Well, step one is get into a life group. And you'll probably find a few Priscilla's and a few Aquila's that are going to help you take care of the ministry that God has called you to accomplish on this planet. So that's one thing I want to highlight. The other O, this is interesting, that God sends an angel to meet Paul in the middle of his journey in Corinth. Now, why was an angel necessary? Well, I believe that Paul probably had some temptations to say, I don't want to do this anymore. Every time Paul would enter into cities, two things would happen. There would be revivals and there would be riots. <laughs> and he loved the revival part. He wasn't so much a fan of the riot part because the riot part meant he was going to get beat up, meant he was probably going to be arrested and thrown in prison. So he was like, I'm not really feeling this. And I'm imagining at some part in the middle of the story, he probably started going, I don't, I don't know, man. I know what happened before, and I know this is probably going to happen again. God, call somebody else. 
Like, can, where, can I tap out? Like, where, like I don't want to do this anymore. Have you ever gotten into a place in your life where you just wanted to quit? You just got so tired. You're just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I believe supernaturally God brought some of you here because God knew I was going to be speaking on this. You're here today and you want to quit. You want to give up. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your job. Maybe you just, you got a jerk face boss that's giving you a hard time and you're just like, I hate that guy. Maybe, maybe it's a marriage. It's like, I, I, I don't know. I just don't think I have the bandwidth to keep doing this. Maybe it's even your life. Maybe stuff just hasn't worked out and you're just like, I, I don't know if I can go on. But let me tell you, when you're in those head spaces, God knows it. And he's so faithful to send encouragers to get you out of that headspace. And I want you to know, I want to be that angel today for you. You know what an angel is by definition? Is, an, is a messenger spirit sent from God to do God's work. That's, a, that's an angel. And I believe that God wants us as his church filled with his spirit to be his messengers to weary people who want to quit. And he'll give you, he'll give you a prompting. He'll say, text so-and-so. Call so-and-so. And you have no idea. You're just like, hey, bro, I'm just like texting you. You just popped up. And I just, want, I, I just want to let you know, man, I'm here for you if you ever want to talk. Or, hey, I got this verse. I was, I was just kind of praying for you, and this verse came in my You're an angel of God. And I believe right now in this moment, I'm an angel for some of you in this space because everything inside of you is wanting to quit. Let me tell you something I learned years ago. If the devil can't make you bad, he will make you want to quit. He may not get you with some temptation, he may not get you in these things of like, you know, derailing your life or sabotaging your future, but he can get in your ear and he can make it so easy and so tempting to say, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I want to speak louder than that voice in your head that's telling you to quit. And I want to declare to you, keep going, because the promises of God are right around the corner. And if you stop now, you will never taste and see the goodness of God and the breakthrough that he has for you and your marriage and your family and your career and your finances. And I can keep going on and on and on. Your breakthrough is coming, and it will only come if you refuse to quit. Knuckle bump your neighbor say, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Keep going. I, I, man, I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, Trey and Ariel are, are, are familiar with ministry. and They can relate to me on this. Some of you that have been in ministry before, it can get tough sometimes working with people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be real right now. It can be tough. And, man, when God started talking to Tara and I and started speaking to us about planting a new church, and I was almost 50, and I knew, I knew it went from God releasing us from Vegas to planting this church here. I was like, man, God, I don't know. And Tara was so excited because, I mean, it was Thousand Oaks. She was like, Jim, I mean, look where we're moving. I go, I know, I know, but it's going to be tough. And about a couple months into it, Tara's like, this is tough. I go, that's what I was trying to tell you. <laughs> Wearing all these hats and doing all these things. And then in the middle of that, COVID happens. It was like, what are you guys going to do? I go, I don't know. God, you sent us here and then this pandemic, what are we going to do? So we just kept trusting God. And every time it just got a little gritty and a little overwhelming to where I start having thought bubbles going, do I really want to keep doing this? Do I really want to keep going? An angel would come on scene. I'd get a text. I'd get an email. I'd get somebody just talking to me and saying, Pastor Jim, you have no idea what that message did to me. You have no idea what that prayer did did for my marriage. Yeah. And, and they would just be these little subtle things where an encouragement would happen and I just heard the voice of God in that encouragement say, keep going. 
keep doing this. Lives are being changed. People are being healed. Families are being restored. Jim, keep going. So next time the Holy Spirit gives you a prompting to encourage me, do it. Because I might be wanting to quit that day, all right? You just got to do that. So not that I want to quit, all right? So I just want to set the record straight. I'm doing great. Everything's good. Everyone's like, do we need to really pray for you right now? No, I was, everything's good. But I, I will tell you that, that we need to be the angels that God wants to use to help encourage other people when they're in the middle of their mess. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, third observation, write this down. Everyone's got a beginning. Everyone has a beginning. Every, everyone has a start. And I, and I wanted to feature this because there, most human beings... We start judging a space from a perspective that everyone shares the place that we're coming from. When in reality, you may be the only one experiencing your faith the way you are experiencing it. And and I I have to remind all of us about this because, you see, some of you are brand new to our church. You're brand new to faith. You're brand new to concept of, like, God and Jesus, and you're just like absorbing all. Others of you, you've been coming to church for decades. You made a decision to follow Jesus years ago. And if you're not careful, you can make some assumptions when you're walking into a room like that. Well, everyone knows the Bible. Everyone knows scripture. Every, like, you know, this is, this, everyone knows that. No, 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 no. There's a spectrum represented in this room. I want you to know that. This isn't like church in the ancient times where everyone's coming to a house because they're already followers of Jesus. A a, a gathering like this is now an invitation for people to come as they are, to come in and and receive an invitation to follow Jesus. So we have people in this room, I mean, you're so far and advanced in your faith in God. I mean, you you know, you're like, I, I know Hebrew. I, I, I know Greek. I mean, I, can, I, I know every doctrine of every major denomination in America. Like, I know it all. And I'm like, good for you. Praise God. But don't forget that there is a person maybe sitting next to you that walked into this place going, this is so weird. You guys do karaoke? At like, like, what is it? Like, you guys are all, like, this is odd. Like, this is like, this like, everyone's hugging people? Like, this is weird. So don't forget your beginning. Because people in this room are at their start. And if you forget your start, it's going to be so easy for you to get lost in helping that other person with their next step in their start. Because you're just expecting people to be at the level that you're at. And they will. They will, but they need you to help them get there. And if you put these assumptions on them, there's going to be a breakdown in communication. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy to me. The grace of God is so good. You know, some of you that are brand new, you're looking around, people are like, they don't get me. They don't understand me. Oh, yeah, we do. Because we were you once. We were there. You know, I'm a pastor with the past. You know, I would come to Bible studies high as a kite. I did. I, I'm not proud of that, but I'm just saying that that's where I was. And, and some of you just got, you got to remember where you came from. Because those people that are new will, will connect with you. We're inspired by our successes, but we connect through our weaknesses. So, so don't forget where you came from. Remember that you had a beginning. And this is kind of where, where Paul's at. He's, he's at the beginning of this new movement, and he's recognizing, man... Corinth is full of messed up people, man. They got prostitutes running around. It's like they're worshiping through sex, and they got this darkness and drunkenness and just crazy. So, so people are getting saved, but they're coming in with all these hurts and these habits and these hang-ups that are part of their story, and it's been part of their story for maybe decades. And they're coming in and saying, I believe in Jesus, And Paul recognized it's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to learn how to live like Jesus. 
And so Paul's mission was like, I don't want to just come and do this crusade. Everyone come forward and receive Jesus. Hops in his SUV and he drives out of Corinth going, all right, good luck to you guys. You, you said the prayer. You filled out the card. You're good. He's like, no. He's like, I'm here and I'm staying here and I'm going to do the hard work, the messy work, because I know that these people, they found Jesus. They are following Jesus but they need somebody to come alongside them to help them work through their hurts and their habits and their hangups so they can fully be devoted to Jesus the way they are called to be a follower of Jesus. They need, they need help. And Paul was that kind of a pastor. He was that kind of a leader saying, I'm willing to be in the trenches with you. I'm willing to do the messy work. See, this is what frustrates me as a pastor. Everyone's like, we want revival. Let's bring revival. Do you know what you're asking for? Do you know what you're asking? You're asking for God to bring a group of people out of their darkness into his light. And that is going to require us to be willing to roll up our sleeves and do some messy work to help these people learn to live like Jesus. That could require you having to put a homeless dude in your brand new Tesla. Oh, Lord, I want revival. Okay, we need you to pick up this guy that, that has been living on the streets and he needs to go to this, uh, this place. And, and so like, what? Yeah, in your, yeah, in your Tesla. Yeah. This is messy. Messy. Hey, we need you to just go and meet with this guy. Uh, he's suicidal. It's 1 a.m. I know it's like we're sleepy time, but you know what? You got to get up. You got to do it. This week, man, I got hit hard with a case and probably one of the, the hardest ones in, in my history of being a pastor. And I took a deep breath and I told my wife, I go, this is going to be messy. But this is why God's called me into ministry, to meet people in their mess. So I loved a guy and I kept loving a guy and kept working and doing stuff. I was on the phone, like it seemed like an all, like it was all day long just helping work this guy because he, he was in jeopardy of taking his life. And I had to walk him through this. And, and the praise report is he was at last, at last services gathering. He was here. He was here. So that was good. That was good. That was good. And I don't say that to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying that revival means we're willing to get messy because it's going to involve messy people. And messy people are going to make messes. They're going to make messes. How many of you love clean and tidy? You love clean and tidy. Yeah, okay, all right, right. But how many have that one person in your home that is not signing up for that? They're just messy. Oh, come on, let's do a survey. How many of you have a messy person or a couple of them in your house? All right, here's the fact. All it takes is one messy person to make the whole house a mess. <laughs> And so if you have a whole crop of messy people, it's, it's going to make the church a mess. So what do you, what do, you do with this? How, how do you process this? Well, Paul was in it to make disciples because he, he took Jesus' commission seriously. Go and make disciples. Go make disciples. Don't, don't make you know, converts that said yes to follow me. Go make disciples. Go teach them how to live as Jesus lived. So if you want to do this, if, if, if you're all in for revival, it's going to require three things. And Paul walks us through this process in the book of 1 Corinthians. So this is kind of an introduction today. We're going to get into the mess next week. So come back for, for part two of this. We're going to get into the mess. But here, here's the first word that you need to be reminded of when it comes to messy people, and that is grace. 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 It's a, it's a churchy word. A lot of us hear this word. It literally means unmerited favor. This word inspires us on the area of forgiveness because we know that the cross represents grace because the cross is Jesus' declaration to us that even though you've messed up, even though you've done things that deserve the wrath of God, that Christ died for you while you were still separated in a sinner and an enemy to God. He died for you. That's grace. That's why we sing that song, Amazing Grace. 
because we understand that if it wasn't for the grace of God for our lives, there would be no hope for our lives. So, so it's grace. Grace is the featured component that allows us to tick as followers of Jesus. And you need to understand this grace for yourself in order for you to enter in to giving grace away to others. Because you cannot be a grace giver unless you're first a grace receiver. Are you tracking with me, church? How, how do you know if you're a grace receiver? I mean, how, how does it sit with you that, that God loves you in spite of what you've done? How does it sit with you that God forgives you even though you've done some unforgivable things? Because if truth be told, we have a hard time forgiving ourselves sometimes because we're like, man, I, uh, man I, I, how did I do that? We have a hard time loving ourselves because we know some of the things that we've done. But you got to go beyond your own ability to see things. And this is where the work of the cross really helps us process this. Even though you can't maybe love yourself, even though you can't forgive yourself, the cross declares to you that God loves you, he sees you, he cares about you, and he forgives you. And so you enter into that, and then it will be easier for you to give that away to other people. In another letter he writes to the Colossian church, he says, hey, forgive other people in the same way that you've been forgiven by Christ. In the same way. This is what this grace peace is. And if you, if you can't receive the grace, more than likely, you're not going to be able to give away the grace. Let, let me take you to scripture, Hebrews 12. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's just interesting. We talked about that last week. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. There it is. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So the grace of God is your antidote against bitterness rising up in your heart towards other people. Did you know that? The more you receive the grace yourself, the easier it is to bring forgiveness to other people that have hurt you, wounded you, or offended you. And bitterness will not be able to rise up in your soul. And some of you right now, the bitterness that you have towards somebody is an indication that you haven't really soaked in and marinated in the grace of God that he's offering you. Because the more that you are soaking in and saturating your life with the grace of God that he's offered your life, the easier it will be to let somebody else go. Now, I'm not saying you have to forget what they did. I'm not saying you have to be best friends with them. And I'm not here to valid, validate them and say, no, it wasn't really that bad. You know what? Some of it was bad. It was really bad. And you're valid to feel the way you feel towards them. But what God is calling us to do is to let them go and to forgive them in the same way that you, my friend, have been forgiven by your heavenly father. That, that's, that's what it comes down to. Now, as we're tracking together on this principle, okay, Messy people are going to require a lot of grace. Can I say that one more time? Messy people are going to require a lot of grace. Now, he's writing, Paul's writing this letter, okay? He's writing this letter. It's been four and a half years since he planted the church in Acts 18 when he writes 1 Corinthians. Four and a half years. Funny God wink for me. Do you know how long we've been together as a church family? Four and a half years. <laughs> I love that. I just love that. But listen to what he says in verse 3 of chapter 1. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. He starts his letter with what, church? Grace. Grace, let me tell you something about your life. You will run into people that absolutely need grace. They need grace. I will tell you in a church this way, there are a lot of people in this room that, that I call it 
I, I call these people EGRs, extra grace required. <laughs> Have you ever met somebody like that? You're like, that person doesn't just need a little bit of grace, they need a lot. EGRs, every church has a few of them. I will tell you, I think every family has an EGR in it. Every family, your family included, your family has an, a person where extra grace is required. Are you thinking of that person right now? You're like, yep, mm-hmm, yep. Well, let me tell you, if you're not thinking of that person, you are the EGR of your family. <laughs> Everyone's like, they're thinking of you. They're like, yes, <laughs> let's just be real. All, all of us are like, we're just like, but, but that grace is like, you know what? Yeah, they said something dumb. I'm not going to cancel them. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a talk with them, but I'm going to walk with them. Yeah, because, I mean, they're walking through so much hurt, and I recognize that hurt people hurt people. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some grace. I, I, had, I had a guy, this is a true story, this happened to me. I had a guy that texted me, I, I think I've told this story. He texts me, but he thought he was texting someone else. He texts me about me. <laughs> and it, it this, has that ever happened to anybody else? Is that okay? A couple of you guys, both of you guys together. So I'm reading this text and I'm like, this is not making any sense. And it was, it was, it was not very kind. And I was like, wow, I think this is about me. <laughs> and then a, a couple hours later, he calls me. And he goes, I got to fall on my sword, man. He goes, that was for somebody else. And I go, I thought so. <laughs> I didn't think you would send it to me. And he said, would you forgive me? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Because I've been graced out. And that guy is still my friend. I didn't cancel him. I didn't kick him out of my life like, I can't believe you did that to me, bro. Get out of my face. I'm like, no. He made a mistake. Welcome to the human race. And if God's grace is greater than my greatest mistake, certainly I can give a little of that grace out to a bro that did something that was a little bit mean. All right? And uh, that just happens to everybody. So here's the second point, right? Or second point, write this down. Relational equity, I call it. Relational equity. You, you might want to write next to that term down connection, connection. We had some great connection here Monday and Thursday with the guys and the gals. And I, I want you to know that, that Paul was in the trenches with these people. He did life with these people. He was, he was there with these people. He, he knew their families. He he walked with them and he talked with them and and, and he, he knew their stories. He was there, most Bible scholars believe he was there for like two years. Like if you were to take all the time from Acts 18 until like he left. So he knew these people. He spent time with them. He, he coached them up. And that was necessary because in order for him to be able to train people and show them how to live like Jesus, he had to give those people access to his life. They didn't have a Bible that they just opened up and said, okay, if you want to learn how to live like Jesus, just read, you know, Ephesians chapter 4. There was no Ephesians 4. So how did he have to do it? He had to show them. He had to be an example. Check out what he writes in chapter 11. He said, uh, chap, uh, yeah, there you go. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. Let's go to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the next one. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So he was, he was giving people access to his life. And they were getting to watch not just what he said, but what he did. Hello, somebody. What if I asked you a question? If people followed you, would you say they are following Christ? If they did what you did, would they be following Christ? Paul says, hey, confid confidently, I can say this. Like, hey, you guys watched my life. You've done what, you, you, you've seen how I reacted when that guy cut me off on, on the freeway. And you, you've seen how, you know, I, I handled the, the people that beat me up. You've seen my reaction. 
And I'm convinced Christianity has shown more in our reaction than it is in our actions. Paul's saying, you guys have walked with me. You've seen me on the tough days. And I've continued to rejoice. I've continued to give thanks. Follow my example as I follow Christ's example. This is our call. And people won't know how to follow Jesus if, number one, you're not really following Jesus, but, number two, they don't have access to you. That's why I want to be a pastor. I don't, I don't care how many people go. I, I want to be with you guys. I don't, I don't want to hide in a room. I, don't want, I just want, because, man, I, I want you to know how to live like Jesus lived. Because I want to be that example for you. I, I want to show you that you can go up to somebody and pray for somebody. You, you can go up to somebody and give them $1,000 and say, God led me here to you. And you're like, give me $1,000 and I'll do that, all right? Uh, but some of you, it's just like, like I, I'm up here and I'm saying, guys, I'm living it. I'm not just up here going, oh, this is what you should do. I'm out there living it. And I can boldly tell you, follow me as I follow Jesus. Follow me. That's why I want you to have access. I want, I want you to see how I treat my wife. I want you to see how I, I kind of act around my kids. I, I want you to see how I interact with strangers that I'm just meeting at Target or wherever I'm at. Follow me as I follow Christ. But that takes time, and it takes energy, and it takes purpose to say, I'm going to make time. Some of you, it's going to be, hey, I, you know, I've got to, Go meet with so-and-so for start. I'm, I'm busy, but i got to go meet with them. i got, I got to go make time with them so that I can build them up. Every church that I've ever planted, I've always done this. I've always given people access to me. And you ought to give people access to you. Invite them over. You know, do life group. You know, bring them over to your house or go to somebody else's house, and you'll give people access, and that's where the great work and the messy work is done. Number three, I'm, I'm running out of time. Number three is correction. Write that down. This is probably the toughest this is the toughest requirement for discipleship because eventually you're going to see somebody's mess and God's going to say, I want you to talk to him about it. And there's some of you, you live for that. You're like, yes. <laughs> some of you have the gift of confrontation. You love it. Most of us, though, if we're honest, we run from it. We hate it. How many are with me on that? Ah, just don't like it. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, it is. But this is, this is where connection comes before correction. This, honestly, this is a good parenting roadmap right here. This is like parenting. Because discipleship happens in our homes before it happens outside of our homes, right? With our kiddos, for you that are raising up kids. So, so we correct but the correction is received in the connection. But eventually God will say, I showed you this so that you can be my conduit to bring this to their attention. Because here's what I've found out about people. Everybody has blind spots. There's some people that are doing some dumb things with their life. And they honestly, they really, they don't see it. And God has sent you into their life so that you might help point it out to them so that they can be restored. Because we, we have correction for restoration. That, that's the, the reason we correct is so that God can do his restorative work. We're, we're being commanded and called by God. Look at Galatians. Paul, Paul says it this way um, in chapter 6. He says, brothers, sisters, someone in your group does something wrong. You who are spiritual should go to that person and, what's that word, church? And gently, that's the key word, Help make him right again, but be careful because you might be tempted to sin too. By helping each other with your troubles, with your mess, you truly obey the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? To love. To love God, to love others. That's the law of Christ. You're helping people through their troubles, through what they're doing. And I believe wholeheartedly that in this space that God is calling you to gently, lovingly correct somebody. To gently and loving. See, a lot of times our words are right, but our delivery sucks. 
Sometimes we have the right words. Some of you that are married, you know, it's like, I've got to talk to my spouse, but, but you know what to say, but the way you say it is terrible. You know that gentleness that, that, that Paul was just talking about? Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. So if you want gentleness to come out of your mouth, we learned last week that what comes out of us is first processed in us. The abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you want more gentleness to come out of how you speak and correct, then it starts with a heart surgery that God does with you, and he puts his gentleness in you. And when the gentleness of God is in you, the gentleness of God comes out through you and into words that help bring comfort and correction to other people. And as I land this idea, is uh, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus talks right into this space. I mean, this is Jesus. He says... If your brother or sister sins or makes a mistake, point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen to you, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Ouch. Part of the reason 1 Corinthians was written was because of this. There was some stuff that they had gently and lovingly tried to take care of, but it was falling on ears that were not willing to change directions for their life. So Paul had to say, okay, I got to speak up now. But first step, Jesus says, go to them personally. If they still refuse to turn, you go to them a second time and bring somebody along with you say, hey, we love you. And if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Now, I believe the church has gotten this wrong for many, many, many times and many years and many decades. I don't believe this is like, you know, come up in the auditorium in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people and say, today we're going to talk about Martha and how she's been drinking too much and she's not welcome in our church anymore. The churches really did this like back in the day. Like that's terrible. If we're going to disqualify people for something they did, none of us can get through the doors. You know what I'm talking about? That This is first, like, life group status. This is like a circle coming around somebody and saying, hey, man, like, we're, we're, we all know what you, you're doing, and we're all standing together saying, stop before somebody gets hurt. Somebody's already been hurt, but before somebody gets seriously hurt. And a life group comes together and says, uh-uh, we're... we're even if we have to give you a time out for a little while to say, this is serious. We love you too much to turn our head to the destruction that you're bringing upon your life and the, the, the life of your family. So we're going we're gonna to say something. This is, this is what correction looks like. And it's not fun. But it's necessary when you deal with messy people. Are you tracking with me? So here, here's my prayer for us. That we do well in helping messy people find their healing and wholeness from their hurts, habits, and hangups to become the fully devoted followers of Jesus to do the ministry that God has called them to do with their lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your amazing grace. I sense it so strongly right now. Lord, there's some people that are just feeling it like a, a feeling, a, a spirit. there's a spirit. That's the best way. There's a spirit of feeling I, I'm not enough. I'm not loved. I'm not forgiven. In Jesus' name, I command that spirit to be gone. It's a spirit of condemnation that has no place in a relationship with Christ. I command that spirit of condemnation to leave them in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that you would baptize them in your grace right now. Let them feel and experience your love for them, your forgiveness towards them. I also sense that there's somebody in this place. Man, you have been wounded. You've been offended because you were willing to get into a messy situation. And I, and I want to just, I want to pray for you. Lord, you give them super natural ability to forgive that only can come from heaven towards that person so that no root of bitterness would come up. 
Help them, God, right now in this, this moment. And Father, for the rest of us, God, you called us to make disciples. And Lord, we can't pray for a revival unless we recognize, God, that part of the revival is walking people through their mess. So Lord, as we pray for revival, God, I pray for our own hearts, God. Help us to be those grace givers. Help us to spend that time to connect, to build that relational equity, to walk people through their toughness and their mess. And Lord, help us, God, in this place, God, to correct where it needs, there needs to be correction. Help us all in that. And if you're here right now in this moment and you have not said yes to following Jesus, you've not received this grace of heaven that God has extended to you through the cross, man, that's step one. And we want to invite you to make that decision to follow Jesus, to be filled with the Spirit, to receive his forgiveness. And if that's you and you want to make this decision to follow Jesus, just pray this prayer after me right where you're sitting. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for the cross that you've declared to me that you love me, that you care about me, and that you forgive me. And I pray that you would fill me with your spirit so that I can fulfill the purpose and the ministry that you call me to do on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we want to partner with you on that. Text the word follow to 805-334-8700. And also, uh, I want you to just in this moment, I just want you to just think about somebody you should share that message with. Those are the two things. I'm way over time. I'm so sorry. I know you guys are so hungry. Uh, but if you could, would you stand with me? And let's let's pray for this revival, you guys. How many are ready for a revival? Let's Let's stand together and let's believe and declare together for this revival. Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmosphere Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, Podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.